right, if you're glad to be in church this morning, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. I think Sister Ashley must have been looking in my uh, notes this morning when she chose that song. We are in the 27th chapter of the book of Matthew, and beginning with verse 50, we're just going to read a few verses here. Verse 50 through 54, Matthew chapter 27. <clears throat> the title of this sermon is Between the Cross and the Empty Tomb. In verse 50 of chapter 27, it says, Jesus. When he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watched Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Father, we ask you now that <clears throat> it doesn't matter where we're at in our walk, what we're going through. It doesn't matter if we're caught between the cross and the empty tomb in those days where we didn't know what was happening. And we didn't understand, Lord. We realize that we have to say, truly, you still are the Son of God and we need you today. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless us on this day, that as we are prepared after this service to have a fellowship dinner, but Lord, we're asking now to be fed with the manna from heaven. We need our hungry souls to be fed first, and we ask that you alone would be the server of the hour. In Jesus' name we pray, and all the people said, amen. You may be seated. Between the cross and the empty tomb, there's a story about a young man, about a heart, and a surgeon is meeting with him and his parents, and he says, Tomorrow morning, uh, young man, I'll open up your heart. The little boy interrupted him, and he says, You're going to find Jesus there. And the surgeon looked up, and he was somewhat annoyed, and he says, I'll cut your heart open to see how much damage has been done. But when you open up my heart, you're going to find Jesus in there, said the boy. The surgeon looked to his parents who sat quietly by and he said, ignoring the boy, he said, when I see how much damage has been done, he said, I'm going to sew your heart and chest back up and then we're going to plan on what to do next. But you'll find Jesus in my heart. The Bible says he lives there. The hymns all say he lives there. You're going to find Jesus in my heart. The surgeon had had enough. He said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to find in your heart. He said, I'm going to find damaged muscle. I'm going to find low blood supply, weakened vessels. He said, and I'm going to find out if I can make you well. You're going to find Jesus in there. He lives there, said the boy, and the surgeon left. The surgeon sat in his office looking at his notes from the surgery, damaged aorta, damaged pulmonary vein, widespread muscle degeneration, no hope for a transplant, no hope for a cure, his therapy was going to be painkillers and rest. The prognosis was death within one year. He stopped the recorder, but there was more to be said. Why, he asked aloud. Why did you do this? You've put him here, you've put him in this pain, and you've cursed him to an early death. Why? As he spoke to God, and the Lord answered and said, This boy, my little lamb, was not meant for your flock for long. For he's part of my flock, and he will forever be here in my flock. He'll feel no pain. He'll be comforted as you cannot imagine. His parents will one day join him here, and they'll know peace. And my flock will continue to grow. The surgeon's tears were hot. His anger was fierce. You created that boy, and you created that heart. He'll be dead in months. Why? The Lord answered, this little boy, my lamb, he'll return to my flock, for he's done his duty. I didn't put my lamb with your flock to lose him, but to receive another lost lamb. And the surgeon began to weep. 
The surgeon sat beside the boy's bed. The boy's parents sat across from him. The boy awoke and whispered. He said, did you cut open my heart? And yes, said the surgeon. What did you find? Asked the boy. I found Jesus there, said the surgeon. See, it's easy <clears throat> when you come off of the heels of a Resurrection Sunday and to celebrate all of the good news that we have received that Jesus is in fact raised from the dead and that brings hope to the Christian. But there is a period of time in our lives, there are moments in time between the cross and that empty tomb. See, Jesus went to the cross. We call it Good Friday today because we look in hindsight. We have 2020 vision, as you know that saying. Hindsight is 2020. But the disciples, see, they had lost everything. They had lost their best friend. They had lost their rabbi. They had lost their teacher. They had lost their mentor. They had lost their healer. They had lost everything. They didn't know how it was going to turn out. They hadn't understood all of the prophecies at that moment in time. His own mother didn't understand how it was going to turn out. They didn't know that a miracle was just up ahead. They didn't know in three days they hadn't comprehended all of that at that moment in time. You remember after the ladies discovered the body, they doubted still they had to go tell them. They had not yet heard the poem that it's Friday but Sunday's coming. They didn't have that available at their disposal to read and to encourage themselves. Because they didn't know what Sunday had in store for them. See, they were caught between the cross and the empty tomb. They had found themselves at a moment in history, much like you and I, between a, a, a moment of distress, this, the, this trial in our life, and, and the answer to the prayer. See, what happens between the prayer and the answer is where we live most of the time. See, we all go through some things from time to time, and we have prayers. We do, what you know, uh, we've had tragedy strike. We have been crushed. We've been downtrodden. We've went through some things. We have been bruised. We've been distraught. We have been through disappointments. We... Things just simply haven't went the way we planned them or the way we would have mapped them out. Maybe we've lost hope. Maybe we've just, maybe we're almost losing hope. Maybe that's you today. And maybe you find yourself reflecting on the cross and the, and the dire straits of life and, and, the, and the complexities and the, and the mental turmoil. And yet you don't know that there's an empty tomb just up ahead and yet you find yourself between the cross and the empty tomb. A lot of us live there between the prayer and the answer, don't we? We, we, we go through something and we, we pray and, and yet I want to encourage you this morning. I'm hopeful that this message will bring hope to you. I want to share 87 points of encouragement. Just four, just four. Thought I'd get some amens, but didn't work, so we'll go back to the four that I originally planned. Four points to encourage you not to give up, uh, not to lose hope, and, and to move you from just surviving as a Christian to thriving as a Christian. Because we don't want to just barely have our head above water, where we have no arm to extend to help the lost around us. We have to be powerful men and women of God that we can help those who need help. The first point is this. When there's nothing left to do, God will come through. When there's nothing left to do, God will come through. There are times in our lives when you and I have done all that we can, that we have really exhausted our resources. We have fought the good fight. We have waged the righteous war. We have prayed. We have fasted, and we have prayed some more. We've called on the elders of the church to anoint us with oil. We've trusted in Christ. We've, 
We've went to Ephesians 6. We've waged spiritual warfare. We understood, oh, hey, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. So we got into Ephesians 6. We went and we put on the belt of truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We took up the shield of faith. We put on the helmet of salvation. And the Bible tells us after all of that, after we've done everything else, that we are to stand. Ephesians 6.13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. See, so there's a withstanding, and then he says, and having done all, to stand. So we withstand the enemy, and having done everything we can, then we stand. So we withstand and we stand against the enemy. We've done everything that's in our power. There's nothing left to do. We're exhausted. We don't know what else to do. We don't have any more answers. We've come to the end of our rope. And yet we are finding ourselves between the cross and the empty tomb. You remember Hannah in the temple in the book of 1 Samuel? Hannah found herself right here in this position between the cross and the empty tomb. It says in 1 Samuel 1.13, speaking of Hannah, it says she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. See, she was distraught in her spirit. She had done everything. She got alone before God, and the Bible says that Eli, when he came in, he saw her there. And she was so distraught. Have you ever been to a point in your life where you're craving answers and you're on your face before God, and yet you don't even have the words to speak, you don't know what to say, and therefore your lips are moving. God is reading your heart. The Spirit of God is making intercession. Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, is hearing what you're saying, and he's interpreting what your heart's cry is because you can't even verbalize verbalize it the pain is so deep that our vocabulary fails us those things can happen imagine how the disciples felt without answers imagine how Hannah felt imagine how some of you feel when you don't have answers you don't understand why there was a cross you don't understand that the future is bright and there's going to be an empty tomb but you're in the middle of it you're, right, you're caught right into the, in the confusion, right into these moments of despair. See, isn't that what the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 26? He says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. He says, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. See, that was Hannah. That's a New Testament revelation of what took place in the Old Testament story in 1 Samuel. Hannah was distraught, but the Spirit, thank God when you have the Spirit of God, that He is able to understand you in, in ways that you can't even understand yourself. See, when you're going through things like that, you don't even know what you're going through. We just know we're full of pain and, and full of agony and full of confusion. You don't even know what, what the answer is. You don't know how to pray. You don't know what to say. But thank God that the Spirit of God who lives inside us helps our infirmities. He steps up. He says, I know you can't verbalize it. He said, but I can. I'm the ultimate interpreter. You don't know how to say it. He says, I know how to say it. I'll go to the Father on your behalf. I'll speak to him. He says, we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. We are lip, we, we, we don't even have words to speak. But the Spirit comes in and does His work. And then in 1 Samuel, same chapter 1, it says, Hannah answered and said to Eli, says, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul. But sometimes, see, we're not pouring out our soul before the Lord. We're not going to the altars in the church. We're not getting alone with God. And it says in 1 Samuel 1.20, it says, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked of him from the Lord. See, what she was on her knees and in distress about was her barrenness, and God had answered her prayer. And so in verse 20... See, she went from the cross to the empty tomb 
in just a few verses in that chapter. She understood. She went through the, the, the misunderstanding or the lack of understanding. And then she got before the Lord. And, and she, when she had done all she could do, God came through. She said, because I have asked him of the Lord. The second thing that you should remember, the second point, if you find yourself between the cross and the empty tomb, is that when you're hanging on by a thread, make sure it's the hem of his garment. When you're hanging on, some of us see we're hanging on by a thread. That's what we're doing. But when you are, make sure that it's the hem of his garment. In the book of Luke, you know the story. The woman having an issue of blood 12 years. She had spent all of her living expenses uh, upon physicians, the Bible says. She did everything. But it says neither could be healed of any. It's interesting that Luke, who is a physician, was the one who wrote that as he wrote it. He said spending her money on all of the physicians, all of her living, everything she had, she exhausted everything she could do. See, when there was nothing left to do, God came through. Because she was hanging on by a thread, but she made sure that it was the hem of his garment. And so she pressed herself through the crowd. You guys know the story. This isn't new to you if you've been in the church for any time. And when she touched it, Jesus stopped and he said, hold on, virtue has went out of me. Somebody has touched me. See, you don't get to touch. You don't get to pretend. She didn't just get to get in the crowd and Jesus recognize her touch. See, you can't just be in church on a Sunday morning and say, well, you know, I touched Jesus this morning. Well, you may have and you may not have. See, she had to press herself through. She had to get down on her knees in the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. See, the, the word picture there is not that she reached it down and touched it. It's that she crawled through the crowd and navigated her way and was in desperation reaching for the hem of his garment. And when she did, she was hanging on by a thread, but she made sure that it was the hem of his garment. She had spent all of her money. She had nowhere to turn. The doctors couldn't help. Now she presses her way. It's a thread of hope she has. And she grasps the hem of his garment. And the Bible says that at that moment, immediately she was made whole. Immediately. Because she wasn't willing to just be part of the crowd. She went above and beyond. She, was, she had not yet, when she was just in the crowd, done all she could do. But when she got a hold of Jesus, she had done all she could do. And Jesus did then what he could do. The third point I want to share with you this morning is this. And this is important as well. And it's a simple concept. You've probably heard it before. It's not new. But it's... Failing to plan is a plan to fail. When you're going through something, because if, if you're not prepared today for those moments in time between the cross and the empty tomb, when they come, it's not going to be pleasant for you. It's not pleasant for any of us, but you want to survive. You want to thrive. And so spiritual discipline is necessary in the life of the Christian. See, reading our Bible, praying. Read, pray, do, go. You, you got to do these things. You read, you pray, that you do what the Bible says, and then you go and tell others. If you'll do those four steps, read, pray, do, go, you will find success because you'll not be... See, the, the depressed person is concentrated on their self. They're focused on... All they can see is a mirror in front of them. All they can see is their own self. They can't get out of their own way to move out of depression. Failing to plan is a plan to fail. So you have to plan to read your word. You have to, you have to, plan, you have to discipline yourself. Every day you wake up, you're not just going to be hungering and thirsting for the word of God. Every day of your life, it just doesn't work that way. Oh, you might for seasons of time, and you get up and you're, I mean, you are just starving for the word of God. Like, I cannot wait. It's, bless God for times like that. And thank the Lord for those times. But there may become times when the distractions of the world try to gain your attention. 
where the kids just are, are, it's busy, something happens, something disrupts your morning where you would normally do. All these things begin to unfold in your life. Bad news comes, news from over here, news from over there. This happens, that happens. And next thing you know, it's a discipline. But it's a discipline worth doing. And because when you plan and you execute the plan and then you find yourself between the cross and the empty tomb, you will find that that word will come alive and do a work in you that cannot be done otherwise. See, the Bible, it, see, when you plan, it, none of this is going to happen by accident. That's my point. You Sometimes, I've prayed many times, Lord, today, man, getting my Bible out, listening to my Bible on the way to work, whatever the case is, after some other time, the Spirit of God begins to, oh, Lord, I'm not sure if I, I, I got so much to do. There's, gosh, there's all these things and he says, come, come ye apart, rest a while. And you come apart and you, and, you, and you get disciplined. You say, I don't feel like it, but I know. And the minute I get in there, and then, then the Lord makes you feel like it. And you're glad you did, and you're, you're thankful you did. But the enemy tried to pull you to the side and tried to distract you. And so we find that the Bible tells us in Hebrews 4.12 and it tells us a little bit about the Word of God and this is why the enemy never wants us in the Word of God. It says because the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It says piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So see, when you get in the Word and the Word gets in you, it starts to transform your life. And the enemy doesn't want that so he'll provide any thing to distract you. Psalm 119, 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. See, when we put the word in us, the word begins to do the work. But if we don't put the word in, it can't do the work. But in order to put the word in, we have to have a plan. Because it won't happen by accident. So if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. The fourth point is this. You do what you can so God can do what you can't. You do what you can so God can do what you can't. I heard this last week, and I thought that was brilliantly said, and I thought it had a lot of validity scripturally as well. Do what you can so God can do what you can't. There's a guy that some of you may have heard about in the basketball world named Stephen Curry. Uh, he is considered the greatest shooter the game of basketball has ever known. Now, we all know it's really Larry Bird, but, but that's a discussion for another time. The amateurs think it's Steph Curry. The professionals think it's Larry Bird. But nonetheless, Steph Curry shoots 500 shots per day, practice shots, every single day. That's 3,500 shots per week, or 14,000 shots per month. 100, or 14, yeah, 168,000 shots per year. And so in his 15-year career so far, that's 2.52 million practice shots. Just practice shots. In actual game time situations, he has taken 15,000 three-pointers. He's made 3,000 of those in game. That's pretty impressive, considered the greatest shooter of all times. But to put it in perspective, that's less than one-tenth of one percent of his shots have actually ended up in a game. One-tenth of one percent of all the shots he ever took actually show up in the game. See, because it's what we do behind closed doors that makes all the difference. It's what we do when no one else is looking that's going to make all the difference. It's what we do when we don't feel like it that makes all the difference. It's what we do when our back's against the wall and the enemy's whispering to just give up that's going to make all the difference. See, you're rewarded in public for what you do in private. Isn't that what Jesus said? That's what the Bible said. See, that's what happened with him in his career. He's dedicated to it, what he did in private. Now he's rewarded openly 
See, that's what the Bible says in Matthew 6, 3. He says, uh, when thou doest alms, he says, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. When you do alms, do not let the, let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. And Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you've shut your door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And your Father which sees in secret will reward you openly. But see, too many Christians aren't game time ready. Because when we find ourselves between the cross and the empty tomb, we find that we didn't put in the 2.52 million practice shots. And now we're missing The devil's well prepared. He's well prepared. If you're not, you're going to lose the battle. It's not that we want to lose. It's just we didn't prepare properly. We didn't do all we could so that God could do all we can't. And a lot of us are here today and we find ourselves right in this scenario. That we're failing the tests time after time. The enemy's coming. Temptations are coming. We know temptations are coming. Jesus was tempted. We're going to be tempted. They're going to come. They're never ending. Sorry, bad news. Never going away. Till heaven. So you'll love heaven. Heaven's going to be great. Makes you look forward to it. But in the here and now, it's not ending anytime soon. And so we have to know that we have to be game time ready. If we're not putting up the shots in practice when no one's looking, don't expect to make it in the game when you get a chance to win the game. It's not going to happen. You're going to find yourself losing. See, when we're hanging on by a thread and we make that thread the hem of his garment, um, some of us, that's where we want to be, but some of us are really hanging on to the philosophies of this world uh, some of us are really hanging on to the latest Facebook post, the latest TikTok video, the latest Instagram messaging that's out there. We're not in the Word of God. We're on social media. Say, oh, I'm looking for inspiration. I'm trying to get, oh, man, I need, I need some power here. Well, you're not going to find power in those things. You're going to find power in the Word of God. And if we, and we find ourselves because we failed the plan that we actually planned to fail. So if you're not if you don't have a disciplined regimen although that sound does that not sound legalistic it does in a sense it's not it's just it's dedication. You know I I would really appreciate if my wife made dinner whether she felt like it or not. A little louder, a little louder. <laughs> and so if we're going to have a feast on the word of God, we, we need to have that whether we're ready for it or not. We have to discipline ourselves to take in spiritual nourishment so that way when we need it, we're going to have it available to us. Amen? Amen. I want to share, as we are past the four points, this story of hope. And it's a story about a study that was done at Harvard University with some rats. It was uh, in the 1950s. It was Dr. Carl Richter. He placed these rats in a pool of water to test how long they could tread water before PETA. Uh, on 50s disclosure radiant life ministry does not endorse the uh, inhumane treatment of rats but on average these rats would tread water for 15 minutes they would tread water and they would sink they would give up and they would sink after 15 minutes just 15 minutes they're putting this little pool of water they start to go under and they sink. Well, right before they would give up due to this exhaustion, the researchers would pluck them out, dry them off, and let them rest just a couple of minutes, 
and then put them back in for a second round. And when they put them back in in this second round, how long do you think these rats would last? 15 minutes the first round. They just had swam till failure just a few minutes prior. I mean another 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Maybe they only last five this time because their little bodies are wore out. But in actuality, they lasted 60 hours. 60 hours. Because they had believed that they would eventually be rescued again, they were able to push their little bodies far beyond what was ever thought possible. And I say that to say this. If a little rat with a little bit of hope of being rescued out of a situation, can make it 60 hours treading water, what can you and I do if we know that Jesus Christ is working in our lives and he can change us, he can take us from the cross to the empty tomb, even though we're in the middle of it now, can we not see the empty tomb just up ahead in our life and make it just a few more moments or are we just going to feel sorry for ourselves and just get all depressed and down and out and poor me and all of those things? If a stupid little rat can do it, how much more should us who are filled with the Spirit of Almighty God get th they're drowning? Some of us, I know we feel like we're drowning. That's fine. We might be. What kind of hope should we have knowing Christ? 2 Thessalonians 3.13 tells us, it says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And then he says it again in Galatians 6.9. He says, And let us not be weary in well-doing. He says, For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. we got to be like the little rats, only greater than. If we faint not. Are you finding yourself fainting? Are you in the moments of fainting? Or are you thriving right now? Are you surviving? Or are you thriving? Where are you at? Because we're all going to go through some things. We're all going to find ourselves in the days between the cross and the empty tomb. We all are. This is called life. And until we get to heaven, we're going to... If a, if, a, if a few rats with just a little bit of hope can make it 60 hours. Because see, hope is powerful. How much more powerful is hope in Christ? Psalm 16, 9 says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. I want to leave you with hope this morning. That no matter what you're going through, if you find yourself between the cross in the empty tomb that your hope is found in Christ. And you don't have to go through those days in deep, dark despair, but you can know that the empty tomb is coming someday. Psalm 31, 24 says, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now is not the time to give up. Now is the time to take back the ground that the enemy has stolen in our life. Because if we find ourselves between the cross and the empty tomb, and we're not thriving, we are just surviving, we're not, we're not full of hope, but, we're, but we really are full of despair, and, and we're, we're not where we know we ought to be in Christ, then the enemy has stolen ground from us. And if he's stolen that ground, it is time now for the Christian to take that ground back through prayer, through supplications, through the reading of the word, through full surrender to Christ, and knowing we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that after the cross comes the empty tomb. We know it. So even in our life now, no matter what we're going through, we know, yeah, okay, cross happened, sad, terrible, full of despair, anguish, all of those things. But the empty tomb is just ahead. 
If we'll do our part, God will do his. If we'll do what we can, God will do what he cannot, what we cannot. If we'll plan and execute a daily strategy of getting alone with him and putting the word in our heart and allowing it to do its work, daily Bible consumption, the word of God, the word will come alive at the right time in our life to see us through those dark days. Do you believe it? If you do, say amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us. We thank you for the hope that is found only in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we are not going to get through the dark days in our life just by simply hearing some power of positive thinking. We need the King of kings and Lord of lords to come in and to move on the throne of our hearts and to... Uh, Make us aware of what we might be doing wrong so that we can do all that we can so that then you can do all that we can't. We need you, Lord. We realize you're the only one that's going to cause what we cannot, we have not the ability or the resources to create an empty tomb. We cannot cause a resurrection from the dead. That's only you, Lord. So if we're we're between the cross and and the empty tomb, we, we need your resurrection power. As Philippians 3.10 would say, as our brother Paul would tell us, that I may know him in the power of the resurrection. And Lord, that power starts with hope. And we have it today because we have hindsight. We know that you'll come through. When we've done all that we can do, we know God will come through. We don't have to doubt. There's too many stories. There's too many testimonies. There's too many scriptures. There's... Too much evidence. And so, Lord, this morning I pray for that one who has felt hopeless. That one who has focused on themselves and and the enemy has convinced them to continue to drown and waller in their own sorrow. I pray, God, this morning that you would break them free and take back that ground that the devil has stolen. Satan has come as an angel of light. He has tried to persuade them. He has tried to influence them to think that the focus ought to be on them. But if we would just get our focus off of ourselves and onto others and onto you, you alone will make the empty tomb. And so, Lord, we ask this morning to do what we cannot. All we have the ability to do, Lord, is surrender. All we have the ability to do is come to altars. All we can do is ask. And then, Lord, we have to stand ready to receive. And we believe that you'll answer our prayers. If we ask according to your will, and we know that this is according to your will, that we would be more than just surviving, but thriving. So help us today, Lord, to be victorious in you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, amen.